Okay. okay, we're uh, filming today, October 10th, uh, 2013, from the Labor History Research Center in the Estelle and Melvin Gelman Library at the George Washington University in Washington, D.C. It's part of our Lessons of the 60s Oral History Project, which honors District of Columbia social justice activists. We'll be hearing from uh, five uh, people who were associates of uh, the, the late uh, Malcolm Davis, who will discuss his life and their, his influence on them in a panel discussion. Uh, Mal Davis was one of the most influential and inspirational social justice organizers and activists in D.C. in the late 1960s and early 1970s. He uh, died in December uh, 2011 at age 74, and I should state at the outset that his life and his death were an inspiration for this project, uh, uh, that this Lessons of the 60s, because uh, Esther Siegel introduced later and Michael Tabor, her husband, who had a memorial service for him. And, came to the horrible realization that various great people, Malcolm and others, were dying off without their life story being put down in a place where future uh, generations and current generation could read about it. So that got us uh, thinking uh, that we wanted to capture the, the history and the stories of people from that time, for, both for scholars and for activists, uh, to learn from. Uh, I'm, John Hanrahan, I'm with the Lessons of the 60s Project, and uh, we're, uh, uh, before introducing the panelists, I just wanted to uh, give a few basic things just to set the, so that's on the record too when people view this uh, film in later years. Malcolm Davis was born in Newport News, Virginia in 1937, <clears throat> the son of a banker father and a mother who was a church volunteer. He majored in mathematics at the College of William and Mary, where he was elected to the Phi Beta Kappa Honor Society, graduated in 1959. In 63, he and Judy were married, and the following year he received a Doctor of Divinity degree from Union Theological Seminary. For the next three years, he served as an itinerant campus, campus minister in Vermont. He and Judy moved in 1967 to Washington, D.C where he assumed the position of ecumenical campus chaplain at George Washington University, a position he held until 1984. So it's fitting we're meeting here at the GW campus today to uh, honor his memory. Uh, throughout the 1960s, Mel Davis fought for social justice in the South, organizing civil rights, bus caravans and sit-ins, leading voter registration drives, being confronted by the Ku Klux Klan, and then in D.C. helping organize the Poor People's Campaign and its accompanying Resurrection City in 1968, and helping organize anti-war protests during the Vietnam War. And he and Judy earned that ultimate mark of distinction, landing on President Richard Nixon's notorious secret enemies list. Uh, throughout those activist days, his campus office served as a gathering center for civil rights and anti-war activists, and I'm sure we're going to hear a lot about that from the people in the panel tonight. In his later life, Mal turned his attention to pottery and became renowned for his porcelain and for a colorful Japanese style of porcelain glaze called Shino that he developed. So now I'll, I guess I'll start, I'll just ask uh, each of you to uh, give your names and then we'll come back to the beginning and have you uh, say uh, how and under what circumstances you, you met uh, Malcolm, what you remember about him, how he influenced you, uh, and then we can just go off uh, whatever direction we want. So if you want to just start, just give your name the first time around. And then the second time if you want to tell when you were here at the university and, and what you're what you're doing in later life, that's that's fine too. So okay. just by name for now, I guess. My name is George Perkis. Tim Frosca. Richard Lipsitz. Sally Benvesa. Lexi Freeman. Esther Siegel. Okay, now I guess uh, <coughs> if you would like to start and uh, tell us how you met um, Malcolm and, uh, and... I met Malcolm and we're still trying to work out the years. Um, <laughs> I was attending a training session for draft counselors, and we, it was uh, hosted by Mal and Judy at their apartment in Corcoran Street. And I went there, and we started our training session, and there I met Vicki and Sally, and there were five or six other people. And uh, at the time, I was in D.C. looking for uh, alternative service because I just received my conscientious, conscientious objector status and Mal offered me a job uh, running the office at GW 
So that became my alternative service, was working for MAP, because my draft board accepted that. Um, and so I got to know Mel and Judy through that. Your draft board was where, where were you from? I was from Illinois initially. Um, my draft board was in Illinois. I was the first CO that they'd ever granted. They were clueless in terms of paperwork or anything else. I wrote three pages. They read it and said, that sounds good. They never did another one after him. And then I, I came to DC um, and was introduced to Clark Moses, who was working at Selective Service Law Reporter. And he uh, put me in touch with, with Mal. And that's where it all got started for me. We can come back to a lot of sure. stories, but yeah, if you want to just go around. You know, I was trying to remember when I actually met Mel, and I can't put an actual incident on it. But I know that when I first started to understand or know him was because the serve office on G Street was like a drop-in center. And I was a freshman in, in the September of 68 in the midst of all this upheaval, and I was curious about it. I and, um, was drawn to all the politically active people, and somehow I ended up there. And I would just sort of pop in, because, you know, fresh-faced kid from the cornfields of Ohio. And I was just a place where I would be able to sit around and listen to people and hear all of these rather startling <laughs> opinions about everything. And Mao would come flying in and out, so that's how I remember him. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, First time I laid eyes on Mal was in front of that office. And I didn't remember it was called Serve. I don't know what it was called, but I got a leaflet in my dorm. It was fall of 69. I got a leaflet in my dorm talking about the October 15th moratorium to end the war in Vietnam. So I was interested in this stuff. I was interested in this stuff before I came to school here, but I really got interested once I was here because how could you not? I mean, we're, here, you know, we're three blocks from the White House. So I got this leaflet. And the address was 2131 G Street, so I said, okay, I'm going to go over and see what's going on. And it was still uh, nice weather, because uh, it was like late September, early October. And there was this guy sitting on this, in front of this, on this uh, desk out on the, on the street. And it was male. And he was sitting down, so I couldn't tell how big he was or anything like that. And he had this uh, crazy infectious laugh. And I just sat there and listened for the first First time for certain. I'm not sure I shook his hand or I knew who he was then. I doubt I did, but I know I laid eyes on him then. And then uh, that, that rally, which was, turned into this enormous demonstration, wasn't as big as one November. That was even bigger. I probably actually uh, had exchanged words with him between that first one and the second one. The second one was like 500,000 people. Mm -hmm. We had a rally of 500,000. Today, you, you, they get a, uh, there's a rally of uh, 1,000 people. It's a big news story. That was 500,000 people here. I got hooked. I knew as soon as I walked over that first day that it was, it was much more important to me than uh, courses I was taking, <laughs> than you know, ex explaining to my folks what I was doing. I didn't want to. I just wanted to. I just wanted to hang out there, and I hung out there. I bet every most days from then until I left the school, mm -hmm. literally for four years. Mm -hmm. And um, I could say a lot about the place, but it, to say that it was a um, normal uh, place for for me or for it wasn't. I mean, it was a completely out of the ordinary. It's like, well, what's going on here? It, people are very great. He's flying in and, out, in and out, and you had to know the guy, but he would, literally, he, he was a big man, but he could fly. I mean, <laughs> bing, he was gone. You know, bing, he was back. And he'd say, I'll be, I'll be right back, and then he left, and nobody knew where it went. And we were running the show, and <laughs> right? We were running the show, and he, he was supposed to be the guy running the, the office. And the phone would ring, and somebody would answer it, and somebody else would go get a sandwich. They'd bring it over, and then we were sharing the food. and. And Dolly people were smoking marijuana in the back, and no, not there probably. Probably he wouldn't let that. No, that was he probably wouldn't have let that. that wasn't yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. He would not. That's right. That's yeah, right. But everywhere else. Everywhere. <laughs> but food for certain uh, was being shared, and all kinds of crazy things. I knew I was hooked. But, uh, remind me. I'll, later, I'll come back to the question. But I just will we'll have to ask at some point what uh, the GW authorities felt about. <laughs> This operation, but we'll, we'll get. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. I don't know if we know. Yeah, I, 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 I know. I bet she and I know. Um, yeah. um, I'm glad you said that Mel and Judy came in '67 because um, I started in '65 as a freshman, and I have been racking my brain because I didn't have any connection to Mel at when I first became mm -hmm. a freshman, and I was doing tutoring at um, the hospital, state hospital 
um, in DC, and that was my introduction to surf. So I was already going to surf, um, and I actually became very involved in um, civil rights and working in a, a settlement house in Southeast. And um, so I came to the anti-war stuff a little bit later, but had had that connection to serve and then Mal and Judy and got involved in the draft counseling. Um, and my image of Mal was that he was there. The in and out image is definitely um, relevant for me, but that he really wanted us to make choices for ourselves. He was not the kind of person who said, this is what I'm doing, if you wanna come join me, this is how to do it. He really, um, I think in his gut, believed that we all um, should make those decisions. So I actually started doing abortion counseling when it was still illegal, um, even though I was living with people who were very involved in the anti-draft, um, working with um, people who were in the military and leaving. So I had a slightly different take on it, but that was my introduction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the way you said that about Mal letting us make the decisions for ourselves. I had uh, been in Washington and left GW at, after May Day. I was arrested and did all that stuff. And then I dropped out. I felt a little lost politically that I needed to move from the anti-war movement into something that spoke more directly about my life, which was the women's movement. And I wasn't sure where to go with that. And so I actually just stuck my thumb out, thumb out and went across the country and found various interesting places to, to land. But for a variety of personal circumstances, ended up back in Washington. Um, in the, in, I guess it was December of 71. And I thought, well, I'm sure there's a women's movement here, too. And it, there was this movement that was happening. And uh, I wanted, I needed to work. And a friend of mine was working at People's Union, which is how I knew it. Uh, and she was a feminist. And she was very involved in the women's movement. And that's where I wanted to be. And I, after she left, I just knew that was where I was going to work. And Mal was. Absolutely, you do what you need to do to organize this movement in Washington, D.C., and I'll provide the support. And you just work it out, basically. Whatever you think is necessary, the next step in creating a movement here, I'll support you. And so he did. It was incredible. It was great. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> well, first of all, I wanted to say to whoever is going to be watching this that. Um, all of us uh, in that era had very strong political um, and social conscience um, uh, that drove us. And um, I, uh, for many of us, we haven't seen each other in 30 some odd years. And it's very heartening to see that we've retained um, our values in however we've chosen to manifest them. And so for anybody who thinks that you can't do that, you know, live your values and also grow up and have children and <laughs> whatnot, um, it really is possible. So that's the first thing. And I think that I can attribute some of that, um, that ability to retain that to um, knowing people like Malcolm and Judy uh, who live that and can support that and show that it can be done. And, and, um, and so I, I um, have always um, admired that in both of them. I, I came uh, to the serve office uh, from a very strange, a little different uh, approach than some of you, is that um, I was encouraged by my, my father to try to go to Hillel, to be part of Hillel. And I did go there once or maybe twice, and it was pretty boring, and, and uh, uh, it just didn't um, resonate with me at all. I come from a very strong Jewish background, but I just couldn't uh, relate to it. And I think what happened with me was that I found out about I don't know if it was tutoring or just being a presence at St. Elizabeth. And was that what you mm -hmm. did? So, so, so I'd never done anything like that before. And so 
I did that and not understanding what the CERB office was, but that's sort of where this uh, program generated from. So that's how I met, um, met Mal for the first time. And um, the office, it, I, I'm seeing it in my head, and what I see, aside from everything that was on the walls, was all the activity that was always happening there. So there were always a lot of people there, always engaged in doing something. And so I think it just was infectious, and it became where you had to be, just like yeah. what did you said. Vicky, and, and um, um, I'll tell another story later, but, but I was so drawn, I had to be there also. And I think for the last, I think, two years of, of college, that's where I went all the time. Sir, was, that was an organization, I mean, ostensibly to, you would volunteer to do no. good things right. in the community, I, is that the idea? No, I think, I, I, I'm not even sure that was a real name. I think that, that the serve office, so, so it was, what what was the nomination? Was the United that? Church United of Christ. United Christ. So, so it was, it was, no, 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 but it was everything. Right? It yeah. was the United Campus. Ministry. Ministry. Right. Was, was it the United it Campus, campus Christian, Christian or Christian? Yeah, yeah. Christian. it wasn't. The, Christian Hillel Christian was. Um, yeah, but he was always ministry. differentiate. Was it United Campus Christian Ministry or United Christian Campus Ministry? And he used to say it wasn't a Christian <laughs> campus, so it was the United <laughs> Christian Campus, campus Ministry. Kind of and I don't know, what, whichever. If, w so when you had registered to be a student, you yeah. had to write your religion on the form. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. everybody right. was then directed somehow or another. They got a mailing list for if you were Jewish or Catholic or whatever. And if you put like Rastafarian, well, that didn't <laughs> exist then, or Zoroastrian or something, Malcolm got you. <laughs> or, <laughs> <laughs> right, right, that's no, true. And, uh, or you said atheist, which I don't know what he dared to do back then. But he got all of that, and also that's anybody, funny. probably anyone who was not Catholic but Christian. So he, got, that's how we ended up like knowing about it. And I had forgotten. That I also did tutoring, but not at St. Elizabeth's. That was one of the first projects mm -hmm. that I did, and it was through that office. Now, what Serbs stood for, I don't, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. It did stand. Right there, so you yeah. constantly. And this was 1960. Well, I came in 1968. The right. riots had happened four months before. So anyone right. with like a consciousness about the civil rights movement or what we're doing here in the city, you know, it was a natural thing to say, okay, like I'll be like a tutor out in Southeast Washington or something. It wasn't particularly, well, it was meaningful and not particularly effective. I mean, the project we clearly mm -hmm. saw was kind of limited in its impact, but. It was, uh, you know, it was an introduction. But I think, for me, it was very significant to, um, and again, I came a little earlier, so I was there before all the riots, mm. and there when King was killed, and the aftermath. It was right before April's school vacation, actually. Right. Um, but for me, it, the experience of being involved in D.C., and I came from New York, so that has something to do with it. But um, it was very focused on sort of race relations. Mm -hmm. And it was very much sort of going away from just the civil rights of we shall overcome to black power, the Panthers. Um, you know, there was a strong Panther um, um, presence in DC. So that was a very, that was very powerful for me. and continues to be very much a lens that is part of the way I live my life. Um, and I think it, it was, that was happening and then all the war stuff mm -hmm. got really hot and heavy and so then <clears throat> that became the, the more of a focus. But, but the, the racial stuff was a big deal for me. One of the questions I raised at the, when you were introducing Selves, uh, was was about though what what kind of feedback you, the administrate this uh, school administration the GW administration <clears throat> gave to Mal did he ever get well, any difficulties yes yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes oh yes, yes. yes. Yeah. well there was all kinds of incidents there were all threats of the threats was being a, closed he, down he, the, the school administration was a problem right. his board he used to get completely <laughs> <laughs> bollocked up That's before he'd sure. have to go see them I mean it was 
stay out of his way for a couple of days before he had to go see his board. Mm -hmm. Who were the board? Uh, there were church types. Church so types. Yeah. Yeah. Churchy types. Yeah, one or two yeah. Yeah. were real allies, but the rest yeah, the of rest them were, were like churchy uh -huh. types. But it was yeah. very, it was a very ecumenical kind of, yeah. I mean, yeah. it, was a, yeah. Yeah. it was not a cohesive group particularly, but I do remember also him turning into, uh, I don't know, it was, it was almost like he was going to have be a supernova or something because yes. <laughs> he had to go justify his existence and not only his existence but our existence there mm -hmm. because at any given time in that office there were four or five different groups fun functioning out of the same office. That's right. Mm -hmm. People would come and go. Right. The, the mimeograph machine in the back was <laughs> running 24-7. Um, and he, as Dickie said, he would be in and out and in and out, and people were sitting there, and he would look at you and go, do something. <laughs> and then he would leave and come back, you know. And so it was, um, yeah, it was, it was very, it was a, there was a lot of high energy in that place. <laughs> I mean, I remember vividly but he sitting lost the there. Least. Huh? He lost the lease to the place too, right? They tried well, to throw him out. I, I, well, I have a vague recollection now that we're, <clears throat> we're talking about this of <clears throat> once going to the office and there was this buzz that Malcolm was either going to be fired or mm -hmm. something was going to be happening and it was the most frightening, horrifying thought. How could we live without Malcolm right. kind of thing? And I, I don't remember, I mean obviously it didn't happen, but and he, I have a feeling that he had a way of doing magic at that board meet and those board meetings. I'm sure that there are plenty of stories about that, but but he was always on edge, just as the more that it accelerated, you know, you know the, the kinds of things. We had AWOLs there, we had draft counseling, we had draft dodgers mm -hmm. hanging out there. We had all kinds of things like that going on. And so I, I, I think that he managed, as long as he could, to hold it off, to hold off the, the storm. But I, I remember that it was never, um, you know, just clean sailing all the time. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, Close he was it. always Close. a complete basket case, I would say, <laughs> before <laughs> the meetings with the board. Um, mm -hmm. And he started asking me to go with him, and I don't know whether he did that with you. No. I was, I, I had the impression that I was to go and kind of nice talk, pretty talk about what was really going on there, mm -hmm. and present a very rational, calm mm -hmm. um, visage there so that mm -hmm. they could be not I wasn't the least bit religious, so I couldn't talk on that level at all, but just talk about these different programs that we were doing. Mm -hmm. And it all was very organized, and Mal was running a very tight, clean ship, and just sort of present a calm, organized you know, image of what was going on, which was completely not what was going on mm -hmm. at all. It was absolute <laughs> madness in there. But, uh, and yeah, we did that a lot. I mean, I'm sure we did it with other people too, but that was definitely part of my job description. It was actually the only part of my job description that I didn't have any say so over. <laughs> I knew that I had to do that much. Mm -hmm. Of course, I didn't begrudge it at all. But. Was that place all open all the time, or did it uh, no. close down at no, night? No, but it was open early in the morning till late in the afternoon and yeah. the evenings quite often. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. there were activities that we would do in the afternoons and evenings, and, and there were planning meetings. We had, I had a key. Oh, sure. I, had a key. I, had a key. I think I had a key. I know I had a key because but I used to show up for four months. I was going to say that uh, it wasn't just the administration gave my time. It was board. Uh, there were right wing people in town who did not yes. like what we were that's doing true. at all. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, that's where I found myself involved in stuff. And I can't remember how it happened, but either I was in there or I discovered it, but the window got blown out. Yeah. And it was a big deal. It was in the paper. It was in the newspaper for the for the um, university, and then it was in the Washington Post. And what was the Washington Star? Was it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was how they came. I remember the reporters came around, and the police came around, and we never really figured out who it was. I was convinced uh, it was the uh, JDL, mm -hmm. the Jewish Defense League, because we had we were doing a program. Mel had the Mel had a very open attitude towards people of other nationalities, especially uh, not not especially, but in particular in this time we were doing a program with the uh, Palestinians, and this was. Uh, call the year, it doesn't really matter, I don't think. But um, I remember that he gave me, I, I organized this program. You were probably. Yeah, I was, you yeah, you and I did. Yeah, yeah we did, yeah. yeah. So we, so we, uh, there was a professor on campus, who's a really <coughs> nice guy, he was an Arabist, his name was um, Davison, Rodney, Roderick uh, Davison. He was an open-minded kind of guy. He helped us and there were, he made a speech and there were 
who was a, a several famous Arab American activists or Palestinians who came to me. And it was after that, I'm pretty sure we're, and I'm absolutely convinced. And I remember going over to that student union and getting into an enormous fight with the JDL people. I don't remember it turning into fists, but it was, it was damn close to that. So those kinds of things were taking place as well. I mean, it was pretty, uh, pretty uptight for a little while there. Um, but Mel, Mel was uh, steadfast in this stuff. He, uh, he was inspiring that way. He, he, didn't, he didn't waver, and, he, uh, and at least in that program, I think he thought it was the right thing to do, and he was, you know, he was going to go forward and do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, what an experience! Just speaking personally for a 20-year-old kid, 21-year-old mm -hmm. kid, to say, "Go ahead and organize all this." I'm sure you, I, I know I felt that way, and um, to be involved in this stuff, and you make, you learn things that you never forget. It absolutely impacts on what your decisions that you make going forward in life. And Mal was really good at setting those situations up. Mm -hmm. Whoever said it before about him letting you make your own decisions. Mm -hmm. This is an example of that. Mm -hmm. it, it, because he, and, but you couldn't have done it. You wouldn't have done it if you didn't feel strongly about the thing. Mm -hmm. So you learn all kinds of lessons, and you actually make an impact on the world. In this case, we ran into some fairly good. Oh, so the other uh, theory was it was the Nazi party over in, uh, in Virginia who did it. That's right. And George, George Lincoln Rockwell had just been assassinated. Remember him? Yes, and, sure. Yeah. And he was he lived in Arlington. And they were they had their headquarters over there. And I mean Arlington isn't very far away, especially back then, because it wasn't near it wasn't anywhere near the traffic back and forth over those bridges. Mm -hmm. It was this city was it wasn't a small town by any means. It was a big city, but it wasn't much bigger than where I came from from Buffalo. And it didn't feel any bigger. And on the weekends it felt smaller because most of the people took off. It was just the students and the uh, and the and the city dwellers who were who were who were back. Um, so anyhow, you, you got to know these things, and the, the, every so often the Nazis would organize some kind of rally yeah. downtown. So I, I'm convinced, even looking back at it, it was JDL, but who knows? Who knows? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, you're reminding me, earlier there was a group of SDS people who were on oh, campus. Yeah. And they, I didn't think, politically I agreed with them, but they, I, didn't, I didn't think they were the smartest people on the block. And they were staging um, lockdowns in some of the buildings. And Ma I, what I remember having conversations with Mal about was, I personally, I supported it, I was there, you know, the whole bit. But he had a broader view of what was going on because some of these people, they really thought this was gonna make the revolution, you mm -hmm. know? Do a lockdown in a GW building, and you know all. Well, right. Actually, no, you're overthrowing yeah. Nixon. Right, yeah. domino and, theory. <laughs> and he and and now I, I remember having conversations with him about that, where it was like, it's an important thing to do. It's making a statement, all that stuff. But it's you know it is the day to day work. It is the sort of coming in and keeping your values and mm -hmm. and doing the day to day day work that's mm -hmm. going to make the difference and. So it, it, when you were talking about the right wing, it was also um, well, that contrast. Mel with, it wasn't crazy about a lot of that activity. He was not crazy about it. And he thought it was, uh, I remember conversations with him at the time, that he thought it was, um, wasn't serious in the same right. way that some of the other work that we were doing. And I think he was right. Mm -hmm. um, it was exciting, and you know, you get caught up in it, and police ba police battles with the police, and right. you get tear gassed, and getting arrested, and all this other crazy stuff. But, um, in terms of long-lasting impact on people's lives, I think he was—I think he had an angle on this, which was very profound mm -hmm. and uh, quite mature, frankly. And uh, uh, I'm glad that I was able to have uh, contacts with him. And I think they were more—they uh, had more meaning uh, than if I had just been hanging around with the SDS people, which was an option at that time. You could have hung around with them. You could have become a weather underground. You could have ended up in New York City blowing up buildings. <laughs> oh, really? Really, mm -hmm. some of those people were mm -hmm. floating around uh, Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. Not some of them, all of them were floating around uh, Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And um, Mel, so, and I hadn't thought about this in a long time, but Mel may have had a, a sense uh, that, that there's a better way of, of, of making social change by being more serious and in his own way setting this place up, which was a welcoming place for lots and lots of young people who lively and he had all kinds of ideas in their head, uh, it was his way of, of, of maybe cutting against that stuff. I, I wouldn't doubt it at first. In fact, I, I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it. Because 
because I kept friendship with him, not in any way near the way it was when I was a college kid, but ever, I moved back to Buffalo, and he all, we, we were in touch with each other all the time. Not all the time, but consistently through the years. If there was a demonstration down here, I'd come and you know, see him. If uh, he was in, when he started doing pottery, when he was coming up to uh, Niagara Falls, where there's this famous art park, he'd mm -hmm. come and, and uh, spend some time with us. And, and all of those years, uh, we, as you get older, you have more and more mature discussions about these things. And um, I think he played that role. Whether, whether we, and I obviously didn't understand it at the time, but I think he played that role. Serious fellow, very serious fellow, but, uh, but um, uh, welcome, easy, easy to deal with, fun to deal with. So that's a hell of a combination, by the way. In a he, had, he had the ability, I remember when we were organizing the, the draft center, um, he, and as you had mentioned, we were all kids. We were 21, 20, whatever years old. And he had the ability to ask the right questions to get you to think about what you were doing. And one of the questions that he asked at one point was, because we were saying, yeah, this is great. We're going to, you know, we're going to counsel these guys and, you know, we're going to send them all to Canada and we're going to, you know, we have all these great ideas. And he said, what happens when you send them to Canada? And everybody started thinking and they were like, well, I don't know. You know, you send them to Canada. And he said, well, is there a network up there? How do we... You know, how do we get in touch with that? You know, maybe we should look into that. And we did, but what, what he was able to do was to take a lot of energy that we had and, you know, and, and make you think about what you were doing and how you were doing it and, and what, where it was going to go. He didn't say, you know, we should get in the car and drive to Canada. He would say to you, well, what do you, you know, what do you think is going to happen after, you know, you send this, this poor guy up to, up to Toronto? And it's like, well, I don't know, you know, mm -hmm. he's in Toronto. So we got in the car and we drove up there and Mal got in the car and we pushed the car down the street and Judy stood there and ripped her hair out and said, you know, there goes my husband. And, um, but he, he performed that function for all of us, I believe, that he took the energy we had, the determination, the drive, the because each one of us, and not separately, but there were hundreds of us, had, you know, were focused in different directions. But he was able to take all of those directions and and work with them. And, you know, I think as, as Dickie and Sally and, you know, Lexi, everybody has said, you know, just make you make you start thinking and believing in yourself too and, and hey you can do this I don't know if this is exactly off topic but I, it's something that I've thought about a lot um, which is that our um, political culture in this country there was a big gap when we came along and we're looking for how to respond politically politically to these things that were taking place around the civil rights movement and then the war and other things along the way we don't have a left-wing tradition such as they uh, exist in Europe or South America, mm -hmm. where I have some uh, knowledge and experience. And that made a big difference for when we came on the scene and needed guidance about how to proceed. So that Malcolm, who was like an old guy to us then, <laughs> right, right. like yeah, over 30, right. um, played a key role that was particularly important because you know, that, that other, other alternative view wasn't really there. And so you had people going off in all kinds of ultra directions um, because, you know, you, if you make a break with the sort of patriotic position that you grow up with and suddenly you're against the U.S. military's activity somewhere, well, does that make you a communist, you know, because that was sort of, those were the two possibilities back then. So then, if you're already a marginalized person, why not be, you know, part of the Weather Underground, blow things up? You know, I mean, really, we didn't know really how to put these things together in a coherent way. And so that was why I think a person like Malcolm played a particularly key role to give us some orientation. I, I, I want to pick up on, on what Dickie was saying about um, the place. Because I think that was my most powerful um, uh, memories of that time. And in contrast to an SDS movement or a Weather Underground movement or that 
kind of had no, um, no place, mm -hmm. no home. It was sort of out there. Mm -hmm. I think what drew me to the serve office uh, and kept me there was that it was an embrace mm -hmm. in the sense that um, you weren't scattered. Even though you were scattered, you're young and scattered, you had a place to work that through. And I have a, a memory, you know, and who knows if these memories are real or not or imagined, but after the um, takeover of the Sino-Soviet Institute, oh, okay. um, this is the, these were the SDS folks who came down from New York and, and showed the movie of Columbia, mm -hmm. uh, the Columbia University riot, whatever it was. Yeah. And then uh, somebody got up in the audience and said, let's take over the Sino-Soviet Institute. And it was my first experience with what it's like to be sheep. Mm. And I remember I was, uh, I kept myself on the periphery, but, but the, the draw that everyone had into that, who didn't want to be in that building. And once they got into the building and they realized that they were really in trouble, because um, you know, there was the, the trial afterwards with Michael Tiger and all, actually it was in the old library where I was working there. They would come up anyway. But um, uh, there were people who came to the office because they were terrified, because they had been their names had been written down as part of the people who were part of that. And I have this memory of being in the serve office. There was a couch. There was, yeah, yeah. Yeah. There was definitely a couch. There was a couch, right. Yeah. Malcolm sitting with either one or two people who didn't know, they thought they were going kick, to get, get kicked out of school and their future was over. And I just have this memory of this calm and approach that Mal had that um, of course, I don't know the outcome of, of what right. happened with those particular people, but it taught me a very en enormous lesson that I didn't know about until mm -hmm. years later about um, compassion and, and how to um, work through other people's fears and pain. And I just remember being an observer of Mal doing that. And I know that it sort of crept in to a little piece of who I you know, when, I, when necessary, that it, it would come out. And, and I think for me, those are, are some of the, um, the most powerful pieces of, of my experience at, at the serve office with Mal. Is he was almost like he, you know, the, the, um, his approach to life and the way he did things kind of set, um, you know, seeped into you and was like sort of reserved for later, you know, when you understood it better, when you grew up. Yeah. So I, I, I felt that moment was a very special one for me. Dickie uh, mentioned it, uh, I think something about going to classes or not. Were you all regularly going to classes? Sometimes <laughs> going to classes? Not a chance. Uh, uh, oh, I went yeah. to the ones did, I liked. Did, <laughs> I mean. did, did Mal ever say, you don't seem to ever be in class? Or uh, I don't think he, I don't, he I didn't get on our backs about that. I don't remember that. But ask me no questions, I'll tell yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, but, right. but I do have a story about that because um, <laughs> This was, this must have been in, set, it was, I think it was the year I graduated. So there was a big demonstration where all the National Guard were out there. Oh, and I remember I was taking a um, final, it was either a final or a midterm, <coughs> in um, <coughs> early Aegean and Greek civilization. The reason I remember it is because the, there were four questions and you know, they were about the beginnings of democracy. <laughs> and so here I am taking, writing these, this exam, and there's the National Guard yeah. <laughs> outside. Yeah. That's and you know, it, it was just, it was electric, what was going on. And I remember um, I answered the first two questions. And then I had to leave. I couldn't be there. So I walked up to Dr. Andrews. I don't know if anyone remember Dr. Andrews. And I said, Dr. Andrews, we're studying democracy and the beginnings of it, and we're studying history. And I remember I was shaking in my boots, and I said, history is being made outside, and I feel I have to be there. Wow. And I walked out, and I remember I walked through the scene, and I went right to the serve office, of course. And um, uh, I think I may have said something to Malcolm about how I think I'm going to flunk out of school <laughs> because of this. Um, and then. Dr. Andrews wrote back when I got my test back. He said, um, I'm only going to grade you on the first two. Yeah, about that. Wow. Wow. And, I mean, and I don't think I would have had that courage mm. had I not been involved mm. and felt support from the service. You know, one of the things that was happening, though, in, in our classes is that there was 
enormous intellectual ferment. Oh, yeah. About some of the things that we were studying. I mean, yeah. remember Thelma Levine's oh, right. oh, yes. Yes. Every one, every one of her classes. We went yeah. there like people were, <laughs> were sacked out on the floor, and yep. it was like, when are we going to get to Hegel and Marx? You right. know? Ted, I'll right. let you know, I have every notebook. I used to write in purple ink. I have every notebook with copious notes from her classes. Okay. Are you serious? I saw, I saw but there were, I know where they are. There wow. were things happening in our classes that we could definitely relate to. Not all of them. You know, that's what the university should be about. I yeah. mean, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, when things are, when things make sense to you on that level. So, and then it was funny because when I didn't finish, I, I dropped out for two years and came back, so oh. I didn't finish until 74. And that energy had dropped so, so dramatically in the last seven. couple of years. All the professors were saying, gee, it's like, I miss when the students would come in here and say, let's burn this place down. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, uh, was, did you see during the, from some of you here earlier than others uh, at GW, did you see uh, student involvement grow, uh, student activism grow over that period of time? Was it, a, did, it did it reach a peak at a certain time? Uh, I would say 71. Yeah, 71, 71 after Kent's. Yeah. Kent was 70. Yeah. That, that was, was the, that May Day, that May Day events in yeah. May of 71 was crazy. Yeah. And yeah. then I, the right. and then the draft lottery came in, so that that took a lot of I think the last big demonstration I know was Nixon's second inauguration. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. There was like three hundred thousand people here. Mm -hmm. And we helped organize for that one. Mm -hmm. And that was it the, there were eggs getting thrown at him and, and uh, you know, tomatoes and that kind of stuff. And it was it was just a massive thing. And then when that ended I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. I don't think there was a big, uh, big anti-war demonstration after that. No. 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 Well, then the war wound down. Yeah. That's what yeah. he did. Yeah. It. He did the yeah. Vietnamization, and he. Was it 73? You know, it they were out in 75. 75. So I won 75. 75. So I won 75. They were, but they, but he, he did this whole Vietnamization thing, right. if you recall, and the American troops were starting to be uh, pulled out, yeah. and uh, I think that that did a lot to dampen, dampen it down. And these things are historic. I mean, they, you know, they get the, ph the philosophy of. What's the, the question of historical ebbs and flows in, mm -hmm. in, the, in revolutionary or radical movements? And I think it reached a peak and it started to recede. Um, and uh, you know, you can get into all kinds of what were the geopolitical factors and the role of China and the role of Russia and all. And I just think it, um, it reached a certain point and it started to peter out. I, I have a slightly different take on that. Um, and it actually reflects back on my experience with Malcolm at People's Union. I think that the student movement did, is what you're saying, I think it did kind of ebb and phase out at that point. But other movements that were born at that time, in the way that the anti-war movement was in a sense followed on the heels of the civil rights movement right. and drew on that, I think that other movements were you know, galvanized at that stage. Certainly the women's movement, the gay and lesbian movement was galvanized. Two movements I was very involved in. and. Um, they were just beginning to develop and snowball, really, at, at, at that time, in the early 70s, and were very powerful for a long time. I mean, and they, too, had their ebbs, but I think they've also come back. For me, one of the things that the People's Union office did in this, the, this, the chaos and the craziness and the energy that everybody's talked about here was it was a place where I felt integrated, because I did identify. I've been, I'm younger than most everybody here, but I have been involved in doing some civil rights work when I was in high school and anti-war movement work and then did that as well at People's Union, but I was being pulled out in these other directions. And it was almost as though you had to choose that in the early days of the women's movement, you couldn't, if you were working in another movement, it was, you were sort of not putting your, you were working with the man in a way. You weren't working for women. And so there was this pressure, like, don't put your energy into the anti-war movement, put your energy into feminism, put your energy into the women's movement. And that always felt a little wrong to me because I couldn't say that these other movements were wrong or not deserving of energy. I mean, maybe they wouldn't get my energy in quite the same way that you would have put into yeah, draft counseling or whatever, but I would never have said, that's not part of my gestalt of my politics. Mm -hmm. And the way that could sort of stay alive for me was in that office, because mm -hmm. that's where all these different right. 
elements were. That's where everybody interacted. That even if we were off doing our all these different things, we were there together, and it it meant that we we still really were a movement, mm -hmm. even though we were doing different things. And now created that space where we felt like mm -hmm. we were working together for this greater good. Can, can you explain the people's union? I think she just did. Well, no, <laughs> I, no, I, no. I mean, so it would ex sort of explain how it. Developed. I, I mean, I don't. I never knew serve. I, it vaguely rings a bell for me, but I. I, I was this was after. So you were the transition. I mean, I, yeah. I just know uh, that office. office well, George. It had a you know a banner, it was People's Union, and I and I. I remember. think we founded it. Did we? I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Of it, so yeah. It's quite possible. No, there's, a, there's a pamphlet in uh, some. There's a pamphlet that you, you might be able to find it, documentary <laughs> that has the program. It's a yellow pamphlet. It's got red. Has red on the yellow. Mel always knew how to put colors yes. together. It was very it colorful. Absolutely beautiful handwriting, and it always looked great. Yes. And um, there's a pamphlet, and it's got some principles of unity, and things like that. Oh yeah, what Lexi just uh, laid out was exactly the kind of stuff. And I think, looking at it now, you're right. Mel figured this is a way to keep this thing going, and and it was a logical, uh, logical uh, development given all the things that were going before it. Mm. World changes, people get interested in different things, mm. other mm. movements come mm. up. Malcolm was a very sharp operator when it came to this stuff. So this happened very probably sharp. around after 1970. Yes. Oh, okay, yes. that's why, okay. Yes. But what it's striking, it's striking to think about because I think across the country, all these movements were getting much more segmented. Exactly. You either have to be with us or against exactly. us. And because that was certainly, you know, my experience outside of GW at that point. And so it, it really speaks to how skilled Mel was <coughs> um, in terms of allowing that atmosphere to be cohesive rather than uh, more sectarian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was not a sectarian. The last thing in the world that guy was was sectarian. Yeah. Exactly right. right. He, really, he had, in terms of politics, I, because he was, he had, he was iconoclastic in terms of his uh, his views on various issues. Okay, but he was a very uh, sophisticated political thinker, in my view, and he understood this pretty well, and figured out a way to keep something going, exactly. and keep uh, keep relevant, mm -hmm. uh, and, and and do it in a way that was challenging to uh, what he saw as wrongs in society, and that the young people who were coming through his office saw as wrongs in society. Mm -hmm. he, he was he was good at it. He's an organizer. Mm -hmm. He was. You know, Mal, uh, just to throw in this um, one detail, he also had played sort of a pastor role because he um, would solve people's problems. And that was not a minor detail. Right. <laughs> you know, he also, in the midst of all of this social activity, uh, you know, you could go to him, which I did at one point because I had a I had left the dorm and moved in with some friends, and I had a big crisis. I had to leave, and um, I had, didn't have any place to live for the last few weeks of school, so he found me someplace, and then mm -hmm. that leads to the topic of all of these group houses, which we should get into at some point. Oh, yeah. yeah. What, one last, you know, the, the other interviews we've done, we, it's come up here tonight, and if, if those of you who are involved could talk a little about May Day 1971, when there were 12, 13,000 people ended up getting arrested over a two to three day period. We haven't really interviewed anybody that's really? dealt directly with that we, yet. We, we helped organize it. Oh. So, yeah, so I, I remember coming on the GW campus and the day before <laughs> sitting, uh, there was, as I recall, there was a women's group that the, the, I still remember this young woman saying, We're going to stop, the, we're going to get on the bus, we're going to grab the keys, and then the bus is going to be stuck oh. on the bridge. It was way beyond. The there were all kinds of uh, people were buying uh, clunker cars yes. and driving That's down Rock Creek Park and turn them over and set them on fire. Uh, bridges were we were assigned different people were assigned Sign bridges. different different yeah. actually different geographic just, people from different geographic regions yeah. mm -hmm. would take. So I remember I had to go to um, not Key Bridge. It was another one, one of those bridges over there. And I was there was all these guys from, from New York State were all going over there and we. We're going to take over and block the. We took garbage cans and we threw them in the middle of the street, and all then the cops would jump in. We run this way, and <laughs> ended up back at Dupont Circle, and oh, we all got arrested. Every, 
and they just they just swept the streets. But um, we uh, so a lot of that activity was organized on the mm -hmm. campus. Now I can't swear that some of it was organized in Mel's office. I kind of think maybe not. Mm -hmm. But it was organized on the campus, and plenty of us participated. Mm -hmm. um, and I wouldn't say that uh, I don't recall Mel taking a stand on that particular incident one way or the other. You, when you were arrested, you went to RFK Stadium? No, I got lucky. I got to the, I went to the city lockup. I was oh, over okay. here at, uh, they put me in the city, whatever it is, the city jail. Oh. And I was with a kid who was, he was, he was, he was having an acid trip. And he was singing, I, I'm getting closer to my home, the Grand Funk Railroad song, <laughs> over and over. And for eight hours, I had to listen to this kid. I, I, you know, I might have said, shut up, you know, and, and um, everybody, in the, and anyhow, we were in that place for about eight, eight and a half, nine hours. I got out, and I wasn't alone in this. I got out, and the next day I got arrested again. Mm -hmm. It was back to the same place. Same place, yeah. You had said you, you were arrested this same I, Yeah, my contingent was the Roosevelt Bridge. I remember that. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know exactly where it was, but I figured I <laughs> never got anywhere near or close to it before I was arrested. Um, mm -hmm. But I, too, was arrested a second time. And the second time, it's really interesting. I was telling my students about this the other day because we were talking about the line between legal and illegal action in the, in the context of civil disobedience. I was arrested the second time on the Capitol steps, and I thought I was doing civil disobedience, and that's what we all were there for, and you know, there were thousands and thousands of us there, and then we were all arrested. I didn't go to the jail. I went to the Coliseum, and it was perfectly god-awful, and I spent like, 36 hours there. It was freezing. I remember we, were, we had bologna sandwiches. We, could barely go, we weren't allowed to go to the bathroom. It was really not much fun. Uh, but a year or so later, I got this notice in the mail, and I was completely oblivious to legal stuff. I, I, I vaguely knew I was supposed to come back and show up in court or something. But this letter from a lawyer came along, and it was an ACLU lawyer, and he said, I think that you were arrested illegally, and we're bringing this big, huge lawsuit. It was a class action lawsuit, and it turns out that most of us, were, depending on where we were sitting on the Capitol steps, we were there legally. We'd been invited by Ron Dellens, and I forget who else. You know, <laughs> had to invite us to speak. But if you were sitting sort of on the far side, somehow that was still illegal. So that was mm. one of the most bizarre things. But the upshot was I got a, a, a settlement, which seemed like a small fortune at the time, and I paid for law school that way. Oh. <laughs> well, we hope that one of the lessons of people watching this is don't think that if you get arrested, you'll end up in <laughs> That's true. <laughs> right. That's uh, right. What are, uh, just on any topic, just some funny, sad stories about Mal uh, that... Uh, you like to tease people. Uh -huh. He teased me all the time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, his storefront was a Christian storefront. Like 40% of the people were hanging out, they were all Jewish. Mm -hmm. Only 40? Maybe. maybe, maybe <laughs> I don't know. So I said to him, I remember I sent him one day, I said, Mel, you're not Jewish. Like that. He says, I know you are. I said, well, you know, this is kind of, kind of odd. I, I don't believe in Christianity. I actually don't even believe in God. And he looked at me and he said, some days I'm not sure I do either. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the time of the heyday of the Moonies. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, that's right. And they would come around oh, proselytizing. And Malcolm had a wonderful story about that because he said, I managed. I, I know how to to get rid of the Moonies. He says because they stop him and say, "Can we talk about you know some young moon or something?" He says, "Yes, I'll be happy to talk to you, but I have to tell you three things. One, um, I'm an ordained minister of the United Christian Church. Two, I'm a Marxist, and three, I don't believe in God." <laughs> <laughs> they said. Thank you. <laughs> that's, that's actually amazing because, because one of the, the memories that I have is also close to the serve office where the Moonies, they, they had a flyer to come to something that sounded really interesting. And a friend and I went. And you, you signed in. I never, you know, never would have dawned on me what this was about because it, they, there was nothing Mooney about it. You know, it just sounded like an interesting thing. And we were really harassed afterwards. Or, or, or know that, that there were any informants that were. Oh, oh yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 
I never had any direct contact with one, but I remember it made us all paranoid as hell because oh, yeah. we were always thinking that, you know, every kind of meeting we were sitting in. I remember one time that. being in a meeting about something or other, and there was a guy there with this apparatus in his hand, and I was about to denounce him as a cop because mm -hmm. it looked like a, ca a hidden camera or something, and then John Barnum told me, no, it's a, it's a tire gauge. <laughs> <laughs> Microphone cleverly. So he had glad I didn't energy. make a big scene of it. I would have been embarrassing. <laughs> but um, related to you know what Tim was saying in terms of mouse solving problems, um, we several of us lived in a house together, and um, there was a lot of activity in that house. Um, and at one point, I needed a break from it, and um, I actually moved upstairs to Judy and Mel's third floor apartment for a year. And we would have dinner together, the three of us would have dinner together once a week. And Mel and Judy knew all the characters, and there were, you know, like, what day is today, that's who was sleeping with who, and, you know, it was like, those were the times. <laughs> and Good old days. <laughs> And, and I was coming out of a, you know, terrible relationship. I was not a very happy person at that point. And I remember where he never, Judy too, the, I mean, Judy deserves credit for this as well, but Mel and Judy, they never bad-mouthed anybody. They would listen, they would ask clarifying <laughs> questions maybe, but there was not like, it wasn't even you're better off without them. It was just like, okay, and what are we going to do tomorrow? And um, in hindsight, you know, that was a really wonderful uh, learning experience for me. Um, and I really feel like that was a great year for me to, um, because part of this whole thing is that during this period of time, yes, we were individuals, and yes, we were going through whatever we were going through and making decisions for ourselves, but we felt like we were part of something. Mm -hmm. And that sense of being an individual outside of this group, whatever group, that, that was, um, it, I, I can't even speak the words, it was like, that network was like my alter self in a very different way than your family, for example. I mean, it was family, but it was like, these are your people. Mm -hmm. And so it was very hard for me to like leave that and then, you know, move out. But at the same time, I didn't feel like I was leaving my life. I felt like I was taking a step. And um, it was a very powerful experience for me. I think Mel and Judy were very good at allowing that to happen without, uh, they, they just never bad-mouthed anybody. Do you, do you want to start the discussion of how the house uh, came to be? Yeah, I'm trying to think of a segue. I mean, I guess the, for me the context is that we were questioning everything, everything was in doubt, and we were reinventing everything. And we still are, I would say, you know. I think our generation is going to reinvent old age. We're not there yet, but it's coming. Um, so I, I moved out, it would be 1970 in the spring semester, and then in the fall semester is when I was hitchhiking back to DC without a, any place to live and got picked up by the real estate agent's son who had this house that had just been uh, um, abandoned by the people who were doing that the newspaper, the underground newspaper that was a successor to Quicksilver. And it was called Voice from the Mother Country. Remember? It had like two issues. They were like the sort of an ultra-left faction and they were going to put together this newspaper. So anyway, the whole place fell apart and they left and the place was a wreck, as you recall. When we moved in, they had spray painted the walls and there was like a cockroach colony in the refrigerator. It was gross. <laughs> But we, that's when we got the house. And, uh, when was the house located? 1405, 1405 21st, 21st Street. Just 21st past and it. Around the Lupin Circle. Yeah. 
which was kind of, you know, no man's land in a yeah. way back yeah. then. You know, I remember people saying, don't cross the circle by yourself but after dark, you know, walking, always going in groups. Um, so that was quite a, yeah, quite a life experience, I think, for all of us because, you know, as, you know, we were suddenly learning how to cook and things like that, you know, um, trying to share all of these household chores that we didn't necessarily know how to do and then negotiating around them. And, but it was possible because someone pointed out the rent was $225 a month total, divided by the 11 of us who lived there. <laughs> so it was like 1875. And, um, so that was, it, it was possible. And I think looking back, you know, we had perhaps naive expectations of permanence and like how this was really going to be a family that would last, you know, and as opposed to what it was, which was, you know, a, a point, a, a time in which we shared certain things and then different people went their own different directions. But it was certainly a, a continuation of the serve office on G Street in a lot of ways. I mean, <laughs> there was a lot of movement in and out. There was po politi politics happening. There was, you know, all of this other stuff happening and people were, you know, forming pairs and splitting up. And so there was all that kind of drama and trying to figure out how to you know, have breakfast with people that you were no longer in love with. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> How many of you here were in fact? Uh, yeah, four, four of us. Four of six. Yeah. yeah, and then, you know, we well, were in different well, I houses. I was around the corner there. Yeah, there was there. We did different yeah, houses right along the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, but, you know, it was a continuation of that very fertile period and we were mm -hmm. doing things, things, you know, we were in touch with each other's work. Plus, there were people living with us who were in the, doing the draft and military oh, yeah. counseling. So all yeah. these military guys would show up on the weekend. Oh, yeah. They would come from the bases to be counseled. And then it would be too late for them to go back to the base, and they'd end up with us. So we met all these active duty GIs, and some of them who had, you know, what we would call today PTSD from right. their Vietnam yeah. experiences. Yeah. And yeah. They were trying to get their lives back together, and they thought it was a fun place, too. You know, and we were also trying, to, you know, all the sort of sex role stuff, yeah. you know, cooking and cleaning, and um, it was, that was a big deal, being responsible for how many people are going to be there for dinner, and then, and I think it's okay to say, there, I mean, there certainly was a lot of drugs, but um, people were also political, so it wasn't an end in itself. I mean, there were some people who were more involved than others, but it was sort of the Saturday night hangout, and sometimes there would be like 15, 18 people yeah. who were hanging around. And um, also, we, I think we should be precise about what drugs we were considering, <laughs> because there were yeah. certain drugs, and that definitely gave it a character. It was basically pot yeah. and acid, mm -hmm. and that was basically mm -hmm. it, which it wasn't coke, right? No. And it wasn't crack, no, I mean, and it wasn't right, heroin, no, right? No. For you know, yeah. I mean, maybe people went off and did those things later, but that's what we were. Those were like political drugs, <laughs> right? Yeah, right. Who I, were I, some of the other people who lived there besides? Uh, oh, when we start, when we started out, there was Sally, right? And there was Pris Poe. There was a, a woman, Pris Poe, who wow. um, she and I had actually lived in another house. Previously, um, so. And then there was there was Tim, mm, there and was, there was myself, there, and there was Esther. There was Roger and Inga who were Roger a couple, Inga initially. Was right. but they didn't last they long. They weren't couple. Mm -hmm. They were really more like a unit, and they later got yeah. married. They're still together today. And Sandy Lee. And Sandy, Sandy Lee. And Rachel Lee. And uh, well, and Bill then, Lewis was there. Bill Lewis was one. Wasn't he one of the, one of the military? Yeah, yeah. he was. He, had, yeah. 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 he came yeah. as yeah. a second lieutenant. Um, and then Danny. Mm -hmm. Danny came in as he was from later. the Air Force. He, and he came in later with Bill. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and yeah, about when the same did PT time. come and PT? PT John Barnum came was in about the same time. He was also one of the yeah. And Katie Bell. Katie she Bell. came okay. in. There. And then, um, I'm trying to think of who else Dennis was there. Was there. Bonnie Scheidman. Dennis was there. Bonnie. Yeah. Gail. And Gail. Well, Bonnie and Gail, did Bonnie and Gail no, actually Gail live there? No, Gail lived there. Bonnie Gail lived there for a while and then. Yeah, because Bonnie and Gail had their apartment around the corner. Right. Right. But Gail did live there for a while. 
Yes, years. she did for a little while. And I'm trying to think of who else we had. Joe, keep in touch with Mal pretty closely during they did. this Most period. people did. The Mal would come around. Period, absolutely. Yeah. He would yes. come around because, you know, it was, plus he had the famous birthday cake. Right, but he had, yes, he would, he would come by and we were in contact with him all the time, and we went to Mel and Judy's yeah. a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was kind of a, you know, on a Saturday night or something, we might wander up there and, you know, sit you down for an hour. Uh, in Adams Morgan. Yes, at yeah. the time, yeah. Yeah. Um, where they lived for... 19th Street, they were on the Corcoran Street. Yeah, but Corcoran was, you, no, when did you move in in 19? When did you move? 19th Street. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. It was up to 19th Street. You know, I, I to 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 give an example of, of, of how um, what the atmosphere was like in, in the in the house. I I don't have a strong recollection of the drug part at, at all. I, I know I I didn't do that stuff, but I didn't feel that it was something that uh, defined in any way the 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 um, the the, uh, the house. But I have a strong recollection of. At least two of us, not me, but Pris went, and I don't know if you went, but at least two other people went to one of those um, programs where you know, it was it was a, a, a the prison guard um, uh, experiment where people who consider themselves pacifists and um, they went to this program, and some of them were the guards and some of them were the uh, prisoners. Do you you don't remember this? Mm -hmm. uh, this is one of my out. strongest memories of. Who are who were the, the amazing people who were in that house, and they came back shaking, and telling it's an experiment that's been done all around yeah, the country. Right, right, you know, right, right. But, um, it, it was the first time I had ever heard of it. But I remember sitting around the table, and and uh, them describing how feelings and 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 you know uh, uh, behaviors that they never imagined were in them. Mm -hmm came out in them and what it was like to be one guard with 10 prisoners. And, and, I, and I've always remembered, and that's always been something that's been um, one of my uh, powerful recollections of what our house was like. Mm -hmm. Because uh, you know, for people to do something like that, you know, to, to, to give themselves to an experiment like that was sort of hard for me to believe in, in the first place. But then what they learned from it and what they taught us from it was, was that was a good reason to be in that kind of an environment because of what all you all gave. We all gave to each other, but what I got from it, from everybody else. I remember cooking. I remember oh, yeah. you cooking, and I remember, <laughs> I remember eggs vividly. <laughs> <laughs> Mountains of eggs. Egg was big. Too. And I remember the food co-op. We did the food yes. co-op, and the I remember. Um, yeah, driving to Pennsylvania to get apples for the food co-op. <laughs> I remember. I also remember Peace Street Beach, and that was a huge, oh, part, yes, of, yes. huge part of yes. fourteen oh five. We were um, down there on the weekend. You know, yeah. I, I, this is a silly. This isn't a Malcolm story, but it's a it's a silly story. I remember, um, you know, how we had to learn how to live together, and mm -hmm. and I didn't eat bacon, but other people did. And what people did was they keep the bacon, you know, the fat, right? And I remember once Mad Dog came in the window. That's that our was, cat. Yeah. That yeah. was our cat, right? Who came? And it was your fault that you got the name. By the way. <laughs> yes, oh, it's coming yeah. out now. <laughs> um, but it was the best name. It was the best name um, coming through the window, and he fell right into it. Ew. And he was so embarrassed that he ran up to the room, and he stayed under my bed for like a week, and it was like full of you know grease. And I, I went, you have to learn to live with other people, and and you know. Yeah. Did you have to take a ritual bath? The kosher cat. Yeah. The kosher yeah. cat got, kosher the, uh, <laughs> got the, the tray full of it. The reason he got the name, I know this is off the subject, but it's one of my fond memories of you, is um, he was such a cute little cat and kitten, remember? And uh, when people were at the house, you would say, oh, be careful, there's this mad dog in the house. And then when I went to the vet for the first time, they said, what's the name? And I, I didn't have a name at the time, and I remembered you saying that, and so I went, mad dog? And that's how we got a <laughs> Well, speaking of drugs, my parents visited. <laughs> <laughs> my parents they were the only parents that came in my re recollection. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother came. She did 9 yes, o'clock in the morning on yes. Sunday morning. No, yes. but they stayed overnight. Oh, right. Couple, she did couple stay of nights. Right. And um, Rafe, Danny's mm -hmm. cousin, had made tea out of marijuana sticks. <laughs> 
I'm stuck it in the refrigerator. And it was summertime. My mother came down in her bathrobe and said, oh, a nice cup of tea would be just right. Iced tea, right? She drank a big glass of it. Slept like 12 hours. Oh, my God. I never told her. Oh, you never told her? Well, my mother came down, my mother was an immigrant and food was her thing. So she, um, this is related to the drugs because she called me um, on a Sunday morning at nine o'clock that she was at Logan Airport and she was coming to visit. And um, I mean, not Logan, she was at National. And um, I went running around <laughs> I'm trying to clean up yeah. and I think yeah. George woke up. There were a couple of people who woke up and there were enough people who were like sitting at the kitchen table kind of looking halfway normal when my mother walks in <laughs> with a suitcase of food for us. So <coughs> she would do that a couple of times actually. Tim alluded to the, uh, to the birthday cake and that was a joint venture in the house. It was Malcolm's 33rd birthday and he was he had said for a couple of years that Christ died when he was 33, so Malcolm was very, very afraid that the end was coming. Um, so for his 33rd birthday, we baked him a cake um, that was on a piece of plywood. It was 34 individual cakes that we baked. And we put it in the back of the car and took it over to the house. Um, and I think Judy still has a picture of it. That was a lot of fun, but that was ever, I mean, we all, I mean, we were making icing and cakes for a couple of days. I think. It was a lot of fun. Did we eat it? Must have. Must have, yeah. yeah. I think you froze some of it, didn't you? I think. He took it home and gave it to the trick-or-treater. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't need packaged candy at the time. <laughs> uh, I actually didn't ask people when they were, some of it came out as to what you each are doing today and if you feel that was in some way influenced by I was just thinking those about days. Uh, well, you know, um, I... Um, left the house and I lived by myself for a year or so and I'm trying to piece it all together now what happened next in what order but I ended up uh, working at the um, a community radio station which was at one point affiliated with Georgetown it was physically in Georgetown I just was listening to it and I thought they were doing an interesting job and I went over to volunteer and um, it was summertime and so they all went on vacation and I was like Myself and another brand new volunteer were in charge of the evening newscast <laughs> <laughs> for two weeks. It was just crazy. <laughs> but um, so I learned, I learned how to do radio, and then I got involved through that group with um, Latino exiles and people who from different countries, because this is like in the period when the military's dictatorships were springing up all over the mm -hmm. continent, and um, that. Um, led from then Georgetown then closed down the station threw us out because we were like celebrating the end of the Vietnam War and Spiro Agnew denounced us in the pages of the New York Times um, he so, was a listener huh? he was listening you know, just, <laughs> so then uh, Pacifica opened up a station oh, yeah. in 77 I ended up working there right. and got involved with that and then through that mm, it was um, that led to the the Washington News Bureau of the Pacifica system, which was five different stations around the country. And through that, I met the director, the news director from the Los Angeles station, who had been a translator in the office of Salvador Allende, mm -hmm. and had to leave on, after the coup in the first UN plane for foreign exiles who could get on, which wasn't everybody. But he was married to a Chilean, and then in 83, he said, let's, there was a, the movement to restore democracy was starting to bubble up there, and he said, let's go see what's happening in Santiago. And so I was working for, I had been working for Pacifica for about four years at the time, I think. Yeah, 79. And so we went for a three-week reporting trip, and I stayed 21 years. Oh, my God. Wow. 
and I reported from there for NPR for a long time, oh, yeah. and then in the late 80s, um, got involved with HIV because people were getting sick, and I was traveling back and forth, and I said, I think this is going to be a problem here, although it was delayed because it came later, but um, I got involved with that, and I was the director of the first prevention organization in Chile, and I spoke on television about mm -hmm. HIV for the first time because nobody else would dare, because talking about AIDS on television meant you were gay. No one wanted to do that, so I did. And um, then ended up uh, coming back to the U.S. in 2004 to do a master's in public health, which is what I'm doing now. Hmm. So it's all connected. Amazing. It is. <laughs> it is. Absolutely. Uh, that's connected. Absolutely. I mean, I'm convinced that uh, those experiences led logically to start over. I was born old. <laughs> okay, I knew I wanted to get involved in politics, and I knew that, as I said earlier, that was the right place at the right time for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, Malcolm encouraged it, did various things to promote it, never tried to direct it, and I found my way to the labor movement through, at least through Mal, partially because he introduced me to people named McShirley and a woman named Margaret McShirley. Yeah, the first yeah, work, yeah, she's great. Yeah. And her husband, Al. And I was very friendly with both of them. And I, the first organizing campaign I ever participated in was on GW Hospital, right over here, mm -hmm. with Margaret. And then I went back to Buffalo and I ended up winning elections and becoming um, a labor leader in town and ended up working for, the, uh, for this organization right here that we're sitting in the room, the International Brotherhood of Teamsters. Wow. Uh, and I'm uh, president of the Labor Federation for all of Western New York, which is the sixth largest in the country. And I think about Malcolm all the time. There are other people who have strong <coughs> influence on my career, but he was certainly one of them. In fact, I wouldn't say the key one, but he's certainly one of very important people. And uh, so I, I'm with Tim. Mm -hmm. it, it helped uh, mold who you are at that particular time in your life. And has impact way beyond that, that particular time. Mm -hmm. See this. I, I, I don't, I, 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 I definitely feel that, that, that a lot of who I, I have become was shaped uh, at the serve office and with Mal. But after I left the house, I lived by myself in, in Glover Park. And um, uh, for, I lived there for 15 years. And, uh, the story of, of how I got involved in housing was, was actually through the eviction notice. And I don't want to go into all of that, but what I wanted to say that connects me to Mal forever is, um, so I kind of separated myself. And I, I did not have a strong um, uh, contact with them. Although the year that you lived there, I think I did com come over occasionally. But then I, I kind of let, let all that behind. And then, um, I fall in love with um, my husband, who is a very good friend of Mount Judy's. <laughs> and so we reconnected um, through that connection and, and had been close with them ever since. So I don't think it's possible to really you know, um, separate completely from Mount and Judy. For me, um, after we were doing the um, draft counseling, um, and especially after the, um, the draft became so prevalent in people's lives, um, I started doing abortion counseling. I felt like I had to do something that was a woman's thing that was more related to my life. And um, so I did that when it was still illegal and you know we were sending people to Puerto Rico and there was one doctor in Washington who was doing abortions at the time. Um, and through that, I got involved with Off Our Backs and the whole beginning of the Women's Health Collective. And um, that was my introduction to the women's movement. And then um, also I had, I had a job actually out of the university where I was a field placement supervisor. And some students were working, this is after I graduated, obviously, and there were some students who were working at a parent cooperative daycare center. And I 
thought that was like really cool and it was part of this gender, you know, men doing, getting more involved in childcare and all this. And um, a couple of years later, I moved to Cambridge and um, started a parent cooperative daycare center that still exists, mm. that I'm very proud of. And um, I've done a lot of work around, um, I'm a teacher, and do a lot of work around multicultural education, anti-racism, mm -hmm. um, particularly for families of color and having, uh, working with parents to have them feel empowered to work with the school systems and mm -hmm. all of that kind of thing. Um, and so I feel, you know, not on a radical level, but all those values are, are definitely part of who I am. And, I, and I'm thinking about it now in a way I never have. I really, I have two children, they're both adults. Um, they never had that excitement in college. Um, they never had that experience of discovering themselves in the context of a movement. Um, and it hasn't hit me as strongly as it's hitting me right now. Um, you know, how fortunate I was to have that experience and, mm -hmm. and, um, and how they didn't. And it's no one's fault, it's a sign of the times, mm -hmm. but um, it's, it's a very powerful feeling to mm -hmm. me right now. For, for some future viewer, just uh, explain briefly that Off Our Backs was... Uh, oh, Off Our Backs was a women's movement. newspaper, right. and it was one of the first, first yeah. mm -hmm. um, if not the first. Uh, yeah. um, and it was run as a collective, and... <clears throat> um, focus not just on health, on gender relationships, on child rearing, on employment. Uh, it was a wonderful group of people. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, I don't know how I could draw a straight line between moments in my past to where I am now, but I was thinking about one very interesting connection, and that is that I didn't really know Judy back when I knew Mal. I mean, I knew Mal, and I was working with Mal. And, I mean, I'm sure I met you, but you weren't, you know, I didn't have the Mal-Judy relationship that a lot of you have talked about. And yet, I don't know when, mid-70s, I suppose, I had, uh, with another group, with a larger group of women, and we represented actually an attempt to kind of bridge many of the very serious splits that had taken place in the city over radical lesbianism, radical feminism, lesbian separatism. I mean, that just people had spun off in a million different directions. And I was part of a group of people who wanted to start conversations about looking at the interests that we had in common. And that led to the um, formation of a group that published a feminist theory journal, Quest of Feminist Quarterly, and that we published it seven, ten years or something like that. And as I was doing that, I got to know Judy. Mm -hmm. It totally separate from Mal. I mean, I don't even remember at what point I made the connection that you were, mm -hmm. you know, Mal's wife and that he was your husband, but because um, you were involved in several of the issues that we published in Quest. So I worked for the Institute for Public And then Study. and then uh, yes, and I was working at IP Quest was at IPS. Quest was there. And Judy worked there. And then of course the split with IPS and PRC? What was, PR, what was it called? Well, we called it the Public Resource Center. Right, it was the Public right. Resource people Center. People underground said it was right. the people. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and we were part of the split. We were on the same side of that split. Another moment of, you know, in retrospect, insanity of the splits that we would have in those days. Mm -hmm. But anyway. I, I've been sitting here thinking while everybody else is talking about all of it. When I got involved with Mal and with Judy and with 1405 and I was working at, in the office, I was running the draft counseling center at the time, um, which I was thrilled with. I thought it was a great calling and, a, you know, and it grew and it grew and I started, got into training people to be draft counselors and, and it, it kind of ballooned and blossomed and one day I remember sitting down and saying, you know, what am I doing and why am I here? Uh, which I'm sure was involved with Malcolm because he used to ask me that all the time. He would walk in the door first thing in the morning and I'd be sitting on the couch and he'd go, what are you doing? And I'd go, ah, and he'd go, you're fired. And he'd walk back into his office 
<laughs> and close the door. And he'd come out like five minutes later, and I was still sitting there, and he'd say, what are you doing? You know, and I'd say, well, you fired me. He said, you, will you do, do some work? Start working. <laughs> anyway, um, he, he is responsible for a lot of, I think, making me think. But anyway, I sat down one day and I said, I'm counseling people to avoid the draft, which is wonderful, but who am I counseling? I'm sitting at George Washington University. Everybody who walks in the door has paid, their parents have paid 15,000, 20,000, whatever dollars. Are these the people that I really want to concentrate on? This is what I want to do, is to get these people to not be drafted. This isn't, there's something wrong with this picture. There's nothing wrong with my thoughts on the issue because I thought that the draft was a, a question that, you know. But how I was doing what I was doing with it, um, I did question. And at that point I said, I'm done, I'm not going to do this anymore. And I kind of shut myself off in terms of politics at that point, and I just sort of walked away. Um, and I think 1405 was breaking up at that point. It was all kind of, everything was going. Um, and I moved away a little bit, got married, had a family, um, and then that broke down. And at some point through there, Malcolm kept tapping on my shoulder. He would call periodically. I would run into him, whatever. Um, I ended up painting their house. I painted Judy's office. I, pa I was, because I was doing house painting at the time, um, after I got out of the restaurant business. And uh, that pulled me back into their lives. Um, and then I met my wife, Samantha, and we said, we're going to get married, you know, and I said, you know, I got the perfect person. <laughs> and so Mel came out hesitantly, because he was always, just like preaching or going to see the board, he was always very nervous, um, and he needed, he needed to have a, a little bit of whiskey to, to do this with. Um, Maker's Mark. Yes, mm -hmm. and he put on his robes, and he performed a wonderful service, and obviously it worked real well. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's so well that, you know, 10 years later, 15 years later, my oldest daughter needed to be, wanted to be married, and we asked Mel if he would do it, and he did, once again. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of, you know, I mean, Mel has been a huge influence on me, you know, I think there was a, a big political part at one point, and then there was kind of this, and then he came back into my life, but it was not, it wasn't me seeking him out, because I think everybody in this room will tell you, you know, they sought me out one way or another. Tim has done that, you know, Sally had done that. Dickie certainly, you know, beat on me quite often to, you know, hey, talk to me. Um, but anyway, mm, there nice. we are. Nice. So does anybody have any summing up uh, comments? Uh, something that'll occur to you at midnight tonight? Mm -hmm. say, Damn, I wish I'd said that. Can you call me at midnight? I, <laughs> my, I guess it's a question, and I don't know if Judy knows the answer. Do you think Mal knew how much influence he had on all of us? That's a great question. I don't know if people have answered. I mean, I don't know. I think Mal knew, I think he knew very well what he was doing, how he was doing it. Um, I, yeah, absolutely, I think he did. You know? Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, here's my answer. Yes, I think so. Very, I, I said it before, he's a very sophisticated fellow, mm -hmm. and a very, very sharp, uh, not, in a, not, in a negative, not in a negative way, but a very sharp mind. Yeah. Very sharp mind. I, I, re I, I keep with me um, his laugh, oh, which was wonderful. mentioned earlier. And, and, you know, it's hard to describe. He, he had a boisterous voice, and he had a boisterous, playful, wonderful laugh and for me what that laugh did was it, it it reminded me that in all of this you have to find the joy mm -hmm. and I, I think that it, um, I'm glad that he became a potter yeah. because I think that he carried so much that he needed he needed that yeah. and I think it's important for us to, to learn that lesson that in all the madness, and there's so much madness going on today um, yep. on, on every level, 
um, that we do have to remember the joy. And, and I hear his, his laughter in my head, which, which um, I hope will stay with me. Oh. I, I agree with that. And um, I was thinking of the memorial service, because I was running into people I hadn't seen in all these years. <clears throat> And I remember talking to several of them, of us, saying, you know, the issues that we were dealing with then, they're the same issues. Yeah. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. still here. Militarism, inequality, oh, sure. poverty, racism, imperialism, whatever. You know, and it's kind of <laughs> discouraging in a way. But yeah, you know, somebody was talking about the mimeograph machine. Does anyone remember the clipping that was stuck to the next, next word? It was, it was a quote from Kim Il Sung okay. <laughs> saying, <laughs> saying, in case of attack, throw your body over the menu. <laughs> <laughs> I said, one, one thing that's different is you could never find a house for $225. Yes, right. that's true. Nice. Thank you, everybody. Oh, thank you. Really thanks a lot. A lot thank of you. Great dramas. Thank you. Really wonderful. A pleasure. And, and thanks to Beth. Yes. Thank, you. Thank, you Thank you very much. Thank you.